do you think it's fair that a shopping center has one bathroom for men and one bathroom for women? What are your thoughts about that? Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Roger. And welcome to The Middle, where we try to have thoughtful conversations about awkward topics on our search to find the middle. That's that phobic. I thought for a while, I just owned up with a Siwa. A few moments ago, Buckingham Palace announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. I act as if God exists. Put your masks on. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams, my childhood, with your empty words. Hello, listeners. Today we're hosting Natalia Godoy, who is the co-host of a popular feminist podcast called Equality, which you can find on the Google Podcast and Spotify platforms. The Equality podcast examines the experiences of women in the workplace and how they deal with topics such as toxic masculinity. And so we're very excited to have her on. Natalia's podcast is in Spanish. However, she lives and works in Australia and brings a unique perspective on the impact of ethnicity, language, and gender. We certainly encourage any Spanish speakers to go and check it out. Andy and I have been looking to do an episode which examines gender differences and experiences, but thought it might be a bit uninformed if we tackled it on our own. In today's episode, we cover a range of topics, including the impact of child rearing and how cultural factors influence how boys and girls see themselves, whether differences between the sexes are biological or cultural, whether it's possible to fully remove hyper-competitiveness in the workplace, the benefits of crying, whether there is anything redeeming about toxic masculinity, and most importantly, Importantly, what is a fair ratio of men's and women's toilets? While we really enjoy the conversation, which is friendly and free-ranging, it served to emphasise just how complex and deep some of these issues go. It opens some interesting questions which we're keen to unpack in future episodes of The Middle. Andy, do you personally identify as a feminist? My mother's a woman. Minister for women. So is my wife. We hope you enjoy the episode. Hi, everyone. Hi, Natalia. How are you doing? Hello, Roger. Nice to have you on the podcast. Our first real guest that we've invited for their expertise. So um, thank you very much for coming along. Oh, thank you. That's a pleasure to hear. So, well, thank you very much for having me on your show. Do you want to um, introduce yourself to our listeners and just give a bit of an overview of who you are and your show as well? Of course. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Before introducing myself, I would like to pay my respect to the First Nation of Australia, past, the present, and the future generation. My name is Natalia Gogoi. I'm from Chile. I'm also Australian. I got my hippie teaching a year ago. Congratulations. Um, thank you. It, it was a while. <laughs> and I studied journalism in Chile uh, and communication. I worked four years as a news reporter in Chile. I used to cover economic and finance. I moved to Australia with a working holiday. So I spent some time doing amazing blood wipes and cappuccinos. And then I went back to journalism. So I work for a couple of news wire, uh, also writing about corporate news. I also work in SBS, Spanish, because I'm a Spanish speaker. But last year with one of my best friends from uni who lives in Barcelona, we both decided to create a podcast to kind of address things that sometimes are not really covered in the traditional media. So we address gender equality in almost all of the industry because it's in everywhere. Both my friend and I, we both became mom. We both have little daughters. So I kind of felt that I always knew that this world was created and done by men, but I kind of felt really bad in my skin when I became mom. We also are raising our kids outside of our, you know, family and in another country. So that, I think, connected both pretty well. So every week for me, sometimes, because we have a different time zone, we gather together. Sometimes for me, it's nighttime. For her, it's morning. So she's having a coffee and I like, I'm having a beer to make the conversation, you know, more, more fun. And we also make jokes like, oh, we are not even able to have a, and share a beer or a wine, you know, in our episode, because that will be really bad if we are drinking, you know, AAM. <laughs> but yeah, we try to make it that because we haven't seen each other probably in five years. So we launched last year and we're really, really happy with the result. It's in Spanish. So unfortunately, our audience won't be able to, to understand. But if you want to learn Spanish, 
uh, you are welcome to listen. You can find Equality uh, and Podcast in Google Podcast and also Spotify. Yeah, Andy so. often has a coffee cup, but I suspect there's actually <laughs> alcohol in there. So um, yeah, <laughs> no, no, doing all right. never, ever. So Nat, look, I, I think one of the reasons we were really keen to get you on our podcast because we've actually recently been exploring topics relating to race for example one on we did one on white privilege we've looked at our both of our sort of experiences growing up and and how they were different but as we delved into that space we actually really wanted to explore the gender side of of this and yeah i guess maybe just to um to kick off into that uh, discussion on on some of those issues i guess if you were to explain to a maybe a, a naive male audience what in 2023 so a naive view might be there is no gender inequality we're all you know it's we're, isn't that a thing of the past what would you say to a person who felt that um yeah that this wasn't an issue today and well it's an interesting question, and I think as we recently have International Women Day, you have, you know, in my case, I have a WhatsApp, which is a family WhatsApp, and sometimes, you know, family WhatsApp can be complicated because, you know, mom and dad, everyone share things. So usually for me, like for Women's Day, my dad will say a hey, happy Women's Day, you know? So I think for me, since I was you know, Jan was like, Dad, we're not celebrating this, we're commemorating. So to, I think that it's kind of part of the conversation that, you know, to acknowledge why we have choose a day to kind of reflect about that. So if I have to explain that to someone, I think for me, a really good example, it was an example that I listened from a Mexican journalist who explained uh, inequality from this way. If you have to start the competition, a man, which is usually a white man, will start from 20 kilometers ahead of a woman, you know. So that's the fact that we women will never start a competition if we have to learn from the same point. So gender inequality is based on that. If we women are a half of the population and we are unrepresented in every single industry and aspect of everything in the life. And we are in 2023, which is quite sad. And unfortunately, this is not related to capacity, to skills, to interest. It's based on a society that kind of put women with little age to follow a path and another path for boys. So I think it, it's kind of bad as well because sometimes we tend to think about feminism from only the aspect about how that could affect women but we don't think about how also stereotype affect men uh we don't talk about feelings with boys we don't buy dolls to boys we don't you know talk about the possibility that boys can cry you know one of the facts that I actually saw this week, it was that 35% of single women over 60 live in poverty compared to 27% of single older men, according to Monash University report. So that is because our salaries are lower, so our savings for retirement are also lower. What you mentioned before about, you know, toys, right? That, you know, we're, at, we're all sort of parents of young children, I guess. And it is interesting, you know, going into the toy section of Kmart or a shop like that, and you do encounter aisles and they do seem to sort of have grouped, you know, different toy categories. And, you know, I, like, I, I think, you know, it would be an interesting kind of experiment to throw a bunch of kids in into the, into the shop where they're not like socialized as where, where do they gravitate to? Like, is there is there um, is there any natural tendency for boys to to go for the toy guns or whatever, and the girls to go for the the dolls or whatever? Yeah, that's a really interesting point. We actually addressed that for uh, the International Women Day. Our episode was dedicated to girls because we also found a lot of research that showed that from five years old, girls start to think different about themselves because of society. Some girls think that boys could be better for some um, activities. They could be better. They could be president, prime minister, but they don't see themselves as a potential leader. And that is all because of society. So it's very important about how we address really young age. And unfortunately, we can't control all of that because, you know, as you said, we live in society. So we have to also be aware about what is happening in daycare, what happening in Kmart. Because if you go to Kmart, actually, that you put that uh, example, you go to the 
your section and it's everything pink, it's everything a unicorn, it's all about like glitters. And if you go to the boy section, it's all about blue, gray, dinosaurs and things like that. One of the things that I that I try to do, for example, like my daughter, it's really active. So I try to don't put her or dress, not because I don't like them or it's because it's uncomfortable, you know? So I think those little details start to shape how they behave. Because if you are dressed in a skirt or a or a dress, how you can climb, how you can run, how you can, you can be as fast as, as, as someone who is actually wearing a more comfortable outfit, you know? So I think these little details are also shaping how confident they are with their own bodies. They also shape their personality, their perceptions. But yeah, like the research that I have seen shows that from four, five, and especially six, eight years old, really society takes into their minds and they start to lose confidence and they start to dream smaller and for me that really break my heart um yeah so yeah like i think kamer needs to kind of expand the colors from <laughs> <laughs> in order to be more welcoming to everyone as well, well the, the lego aisles it's... are getting better <laughs> yeah that's true lego it, i think lego is supporting us <laughs> It's funny you say that about the dress, actually, because um, Andy and I were talking about it in a previous episode, and I was the same, saying the same thing about my daughter. So she's still very young, and uh, she's just started school and in year one now. And she's learned very quickly that, you know, I want her to wear shorts underneath her dress for the exact same reason that you mentioned, so that she can be very mobile, rough and tumble, she can play and, and, and so on. But she's learned already that, you know, only the lame kids wear shorts under their dresses and actually girls kind of yeah. you know, wear. So even though there's an attempt to actually try to promote that, it happens very quickly around what is the influence of the feminine and what it is to kind of properly, you know, dress like a girl. And so it was interesting, we were talking about that example the um, in our sports episode. So yeah, it happens very quickly. One of my friends worked uh, in an early chapter and she said that probably like race or ethnicity and a lot of things have, have been more developed even in the childcare education, but not all of them have like an approach about gender, you know? And I think that's very important because I feel like our generation is a little bit more conscious about that. We all have the intention to raise in another way. I know a lot of people around my circle that they are trying to have a more balanced way to raise their child. But when they go to have their kids in school or early education centers, I think they have a really old style and vintage thing, you know. Like So I think you're quite right. The idea that in the school, like, girls need to dress in a certain way and boys can dress up in another kind of ridiculous to me. Sorry to interrupt the podcast. Andy and I have really enjoyed doing this. And while we don't want your money or anything like that, it's been great to see the number of our listeners grow since we kicked things off last year. The best way for us to reach more people is word of mouth. So if you'd like to support us, then we'd be really grateful if you could share it to a friend or someone that you think might enjoy the podcast. We know there's a conversation for everyone. So please pick an episode that you think that they'd like and share away. That ends our shameless plug and we'll return you now back to the episode. I tell you, um, I kind of like want to quickly share my kind of take on a bit of analogy that will describe elements of the environment that we're working in. And I want to do it to kind of give a little bit of a narrative around it and also for us to have a bit of a critical discussion about it, about different parts of it. So something that came to mind to me is a famous experiment called the bowling ball and the feather. And this experiment takes a bowling ball and a feather and they're dropped off a great height, for example, the Empire State Building. So they drop them at the same time, and under normal conditions, the bowling ball comes crashing into earth very quickly to the ground, and the feather meanders down in the wind and takes a long time to hit the ground. Now, that's not unexpected, but when you replicate the same experiment in the environment in a vacuum, when you drop that bowling ball and the feather at the same time, they hit the ground at exactly the same time because all the air and the resistance is taken out and gravity is working the same on those two objects. So in this analogy, I like to think of the bowling ball as men or the masculine, the feather is female, 
and all the air and things is the patriarchy, sexism, social and gender norms that result in men, I suppose, like you said, finishing the race potentially first before women. So that's the analogy that I wanted to kind of share because I wanted to kind of for us to have a discussion about a few things that I think align with where we're what we've been talking about. And the first one's very pointed. This idea of describing men as the bowling ball and women as the feather is obviously highlighting differences between us. As a feminist, what is your take on the differences between men and women are there true differences both either from a biological point of view or a psychological point of view well my question to you both is is that relevant do we all have to be the same in order to have the same right and opportunity so from my point of view this is unfair you know like it is unfair not only when we talk about gender equality uh, it's also unfair because if we apply the same thing about that we have to be all the same in order to have the same rights and opportunities. We will have to apply that into race, you know, class, ethnicity, disability, just to mention a few examples, because the world is very diverse, you know? So following your example, I prefer to acknowledge and embrace the fact that it doesn't matter if we are all different or if we are all the same. We are all human beings and we all should have equal opportunities to make choices, you know? from the same point. And in our case, I think it's important to acknowledge that we are different, but that I don't think it's relevant or not about how we have to address this problem that we have in terms of women having an and representation and discrimination in almost everything good aspect of our lives. I, I guess, uh, Matt, just in, in thinking about the analogy and, and where this comes up often, for example, if you look at a field of study like engineering, for example, and, and then co contrast that with nursing, right, where one is, you know, male dominated, the other is female dominated, right? And one view of the world might be that the male sex is more fascinated with things, right? Whereas women are more fascinated with people and relationships. And, and so I guess if there's a biological difference between men and women, and in saying men and women, I'm referring in a biological sex sense rather than a gender identity sense. But, um, you know, one, one view would be that, of course, if there are these gender differences, then you would expect there to be different interests and, and different things that, that people gravitate towards based on those biological differences. But an Another view would be that actually a lot of those perceived biological differences aren't actually biological differences. They've developed as a function of culture, of society, of, you know, this is what boys do and this is what girls do, like exactly what we're talking about, you know, in the Kmart store, right? And, and it has these effects from a very early age. It's the classic sort of nature versus nurture debate. And I know that this isn't really settled, I guess. There are different, lots of different views on this. So yeah, not, not sure whether you, you had any... Um, yeah, perspectives on that. Yeah, I acknowledge that, you know, part of it. But I think this is also referred to what we talked at the beginning, you know, like it's like a really young age, boys and girls, they don't see difference between what they want to do, which toys they want to play. So with this example, what I'm saying is like maybe think about I want to be a nurse or I want to be a midwife or I want to be a civil engineer, things like that, are things that are not really related to biological reason, you know, like so that could support that it's like if we look at 50 years ago most of the universities were populated by men right women didn't have the opportunity to go to uni you know you, you shouldn't do that you have to be married but when you were allowed to go to uni we can see that now women actually are more qualified than men women tend to study more we are seeing now with STEM careers you know like the, there is a promotion of women in working in math science, uh, engineering, we are seeing more women studying that. So the gap that we are yes, I think we are seeing now, like something happened now after they finished to study because it's more difficult for women that actually study STEAM career to be working in those sort of fields because sometimes they ended up working in another area. Yeah. So for me, I think it's more clear that the society is kind of putting some pressure or some stereotypes and bias that make us choose one path or another one. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll respond to your comments in two parts. And I think firstly, I'll respond to the fact of, is this question really even relevant? And I suppose on our show, Andy and I are trying to find the middle of certain topics. And one of the reasons that we're so excited to speak to you is that actually when you do tend to meet feminists or you listen to feminist-made material, it's such a spectrum of views. 
right? And so that question, that simple question of are there meaningful differences between men and women, both biologically or psychologically and things like that, you'll get really extremes, right? So on one side, you know, I was listening to a podcast the other the other day saying there's absolutely no difference. It's all manufactured by society. There's no difference between men and women. And it was a very extreme view. And then on the other end, it's yes, there are meaningful differences. And that translates to the kind of things that the genders ultimately select into. And we've seen that in different countries, even with very high levels of gender equality. Um, and then there's somewhere in the middle, which I'd really like to explore around how much of it is from each side, right? But I think I'd be keen to explore your view, Natalia, of um, equal opportunity versus equal outcome and how that kind of translates, right? Because it's not about, and as a parent, I really reflect on this too. It's about providing the environment and the right opportunities, but not forcing your child to do anything in particular, like letting them walk through the door. Um, I think it's sort of related what I what I just what I just say when you have provide a similar environment, like what we have seen in the past is like we women are able to perform and to have good outcomes in these sort of things. You know, like uh, one of the typical things that we are hearing a lot in our society, like oh, we need to have a diverse team in our companies because diverse company also uh, tends to have more, um, produce more income, more money, and things like that. So one of the specialists that we spoke, she has been working in this field for a long time. She's a PhD. She said that, you know what? We have seen that when we put women in a spotlight position, if the organization actually, that woman won't succeed because the whole organization doesn't have the culture to allow a woman lead the organization, you know? So for me, I think the outcomes are also very related about how we put an environment that would allow you to do things. So I think it's very difficult sometimes to also kind of associate that, let's see the outcome of this, what happened if we put a woman in as a CEO, let's make her, you know, this beautiful speech about that we are like woman-friendly companies. But internally, what happened internally, like, you, you still have the whole structure make for a man to succeed, you know, like you still have policies about like parental leave or things like that, that are actually not really friendly for any family as well. So I don't know if that maybe answer more your question now. Yeah, yeah. I, th I, I think with this issue, like the whole like nature and nurture thing, like I think that the extreme view, Roger, that you were talking about of like, there's no difference, like it's, it's the same, right? That we can think of ourselves as just the same, like the, we forget gender, right? Or forget um, biological sex or whatever. It is probably like a bit too purist and, and extreme but I think at the same time like when you know just to use the engineering and the nursing example if compared to where we are now if you got rid of all of the cultural barriers and all of the the notion of no this is a job that women do not not a job that men do real men don't go and become nurses real men go and become engineers or you know carpenters or go and work in these jobs you know what are you what are you thinking right so if you got rid of all those cultural barriers you would definitely find convergence right you would find that to the extent that there's differences right um, and you talked about culture before in the CEO example. Um, and I know that in the workplace, that's something that um, that you're interested in. What are some of the, the easiest things or the lowest hanging fruits that you, you feel like that organizations can be doing to, you know, cut some of those barriers and, and make the workplace uh, more open and, you know, and, and achieving equality in the workplace? Oh, thank you for that question. I really like that one. <laughs> Look, actually, in this episode that, um, that I also share with you when we address this thing, one of the interventions as simple as that can work, which is stop interrupting women in a meeting. Women are interrupted three times more in a meeting than a man. So if you are exposing an idea and you have a man right next to you who is like kind of raising their voice and saying the same that you are saying, <laughs> it's kind of like, okay, we're getting to me So examples like this can actually boost your self-esteem because we women also tend to have more I mean, maybe this is also another weird example. Like when we talk about jobs offer with my husband, okay, we see, oh, journalists, they are looking for, for five things, skills, bilingual, they need to know how to edit podcasts. Okay, I click this one, I click that one. You need to have 10 years of experience of working in Australia. I don't stick with that one. You also need to be good in writing. You also have to be good in that one. Uh, I'm not going to apply for that job because I don't tick all of the boxes. My husband will say, I will apply to that job. I tick three boxes of the six. 
That's 50% of them. The other three I can learn. I can go in the interview and I can explain sort of that. And I have shared this example with a couple of friends and that's exactly what happened to us. So when we go to work, we have actually more pressure to perform. So if you are in a meeting and you have a really good idea that you were thinking at home and then you want to present that in the in an important corporate meeting, right? And you have, and you're interrupted three times more and they don't allow you to provide your own idea, that really affects you, you know? So I think examples like that maybe can actually help to be a more safe space to work. And also like bigger policies that maybe large companies can implement to have parental leaves that can promote that women and men can share, you know, the care of their child. So I think this is kind of some of the examples that I can think about that. Like if you're a large company, maybe you can have an amazing parental leave. And if you have a small company and a small startup, you can start to be like more meaningful about not interrupting women in conversation. I'm going to leave three seconds before... Uh, talking so I don't get accused of interrupting you Natalia <laughs> but um, um, that's some really good feedback that's really, what the, really that's what advice. the hand is for in um, in teams you put your hand up so that everyone's uh, you know um, <laughs> yeah that's all right we can we can fix the pauses in post edit and add a little bit more padding in that's that's right <laughs> I'll, I'll let um, it but also some, <laughs> yeah but also you know the you know the the, the intention sometimes you know, when you when you are in a meeting and sometimes someone, especially now in digital air, it's so hard. Your connection sometimes is not good. You know, we get that. But I I have been in in situations when I'm actually explaining something and someone else it's raising the voice and explaining exactly what I already said. And it's like no one was actually listening to me. So then when I got some research done about this and it was like oh so it wasn't my idea. It's something that is happening. I've heard that so many times from different people. And I'm sort of, a part of me is wondering, like, is it a bit of like a meme, you know, where it's just uh, the idea kind of, you know, fl- like catches on as a, as a thing that happens. And, you know, maybe it's, um, you know, but it, it, <laughs> I just heard, heard that, that very specific thing. I don't know what it is. I really have to pay attention uh, to myself in meetings. <laughs> Mansplaining. Um, <laughs> yes. Wow. Natalie, can I um can I share my experience actually? And um, I've I've worked in the corporate world my whole career. I've actually worked for the first kind of eight years of my career. I worked for all female bosses and all female directors, which was actually um quite rare in my company. It just so happened to be how it, it worked out. And something that we were reflecting on actually, I was having coffee with one of my the first female directors that I worked for early on in my career, and um, uh, she's now retired. And she's fully aware of this and we were having a talk about it. It was a company that's quite conservative and obviously geared around um, old school values, traditional values. And she got to where she got to by, and these are her words, not mine, having bigger balls than the men. Um, She was absolutely cutthroat. People were scared of her, hyper aggressive, and essentially played the game better than the boys, right? And um, she loved it. And that's kind of what she liked. She didn't change herself to be like that. She was always had a bit of an aggressive trait and loved the competition. But we did reflect on, well, is that not changing anything really forcing women to, well, not forcing them, but rewarding them to essentially behave in more masculine ways? And is the future, I suppose, a place where senior leaders can be praised or ascend to positions of power in more um, stereotypically feminine traits? And I'd like to get your, you know, your thinking on that. Yes, I think that is a really good example. We need to have kind of like a whole environment that allows someone to actually perform in a different way. So saying that if you have an organization where the leadership that they promote is someone who has to raise their voice, who has to be really strong, who has to be hard. Probably if you put a, a woman in that position, they could perform in that way. And it wouldn't be if that is a woman or, or it's a man, you know, like I used to work in Chile four years in a news company, both different. And I think news company really reflect the patriarchy society and those sort of styles. Like you have editors who are always like telling you, oh, you didn't have this story. The, uh, the other newspaper has what happened to you. Um, they tend to be really like that. Like you're kind of all the time thinking that you're doing everything wrong. So when the organization has this sort of stereotype, it's really difficult, I think, to navigate and in, in, in things like that. Also, I think older generations, they, they used to live in a world 
completely different from what we live now. One example that I want to share with you was actually during the pandemic, like a friend of mine in Chile, she was in a really bad situation one day and she called her boss female saying that, look, I'm, I'm having some issues, like my kid is sick, my husband is out of town, my parents can come to my place. Is there any chance that I can take the day off tomorrow and she was in a difficult position because she didn't have holidays, days off, sick days, all bad. Mm. And the director say, ah, oh, you know what? Now, I feel like now women have everything to succeed at work. Like I didn't have laundry. I didn't have a dryer. I didn't have nanny. I didn't have any of those things. And I was able to work as well as you. I am the director. So I don't think I can help you. Like you will need to figure out what are you going to do? Because if I fix the things for you, you're not going to learn. And I think that it's a, it's a clear example that, you know, sometimes you can perform also like a kind of more toxic leadership as well, because you have been shaped in that way. So as we spoke before, you know, environment plays a lot. So sometimes women in the past generation, they have to face more barriers in order to break the glass ceiling that also they start to behave in that way, you know. Um, so it's very unfortunate as well. I, I guess any kind of workplace or environment, it can be any competitive environment where people are pushing and trying to get one up above the next person and whether it's like politics or it's sport you know high like corporate environment can you really get rid of that is that culture just sort of endemic so for example you know you might have female leaders uh in an organization but the, like they've played the game you know they they and they've been successful at it but i guess what's needed from them in that environment is to is to be cutthroat is to be better than the competition because if they don't do that they won't succeed and that's not really like a male thing or a female thing it even if we move to a, a world where it's not biased to advantage, you know, men over women, it's, it's you know, women are, have very much the same opportunities as men. But, you know, are we going to get rid of that kind of to those toxic elements or is it just a function of, you know, just this hyper competitiveness that, um, that occurs in, in certain situations? Well, if I have to answer that based on, on what I believe, I think, you know, what you are describing is a really, it's a sort of way to work that it's been decided by men <laughs> you know like when like I spoke with a couple of friends that that live actually in Spain and they too have kids and one of them said to me like I don't gonna get my reward of selling this year because I did got my KPIs but one of the in terms of selling so she said like in in one year I took four months of mat leave, but the other eight months I was able to catch up and sell what I have to sell in order to get my bonus. But one of the KPIs said that you have to kind of work the whole year <laughs> to get the bonus. So that is really unfair because that policy doesn't consider the fact that you can get pregnant, you know? Like, so I think I, be I believe that a lot of, of the things are very structural and, and the competition and the way to work very capitalist is also like a very patriarchal way to address but, things. But to the extent that they're structural, that those behaviors are born out of the environment and the and the realities of the uh, of the situation and, and they affect or well, they can affect men and women equally, right? And, you know, it's a bit like if, it's, you know, you've just got some hyper-competitive colleague, right? You have incentives or you're pushed to match them and, and you have to play that game. And if you don't play that game... You're out. You're out. And so it creates this sort of dynamic where maybe no one even necessarily wants to operate that way. Yeah. Whether they, you know, but 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 they they kind of, they have to. And so I guess what I'm trying to sort of draw out is if you move to a world where we get off all of those different areas where there are continue to be disadvantages, are those things truly like decided by men or are, are men just sort of because historically they've had they've been sort of the ones in, in positions of power, but are you still just going to be left with a cohort of really hyper competitive people, whether they're men or women, who are just going to be doing that same thing anyway? Well, I think quotas, for example, has proven to be really successful in order to push and accelerate changes 
my position about quotas is like you need to review them, you know, because the 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 objective of them are being designed to push changes. Like, for example, according to the UNN, we are 300 years far from gender equality, you know. So in order to address some changes quickly, quotas are really good to achieve that. But of course, when you have kind of created an environment where it's more equally naturally, you need to remove that and then you don't need them um, as well. So how could be an organization where like women are more um, dominate more or they have more representation? That's going to be interesting. Like we can say now how that is going to be because it doesn't happen too much. I think in Australia, there are only two industries where women are majority, which I think it's health. Uh, nursing and probably education, but we can't see that as much. So everything what we can speculate about how could be an organization um, not competitive or or anything, it will be just our idea or imagination because that actually don't even exist. Uh, last year, I read a report done by Deloitte which says that actually all of those ingredients are really difficult to measure separately. So even, for example, like in some industry, when you see who are the women who are in power, they tend to be from the same the same school that te- tend to take people into higher position or upper management, you know? So it's a really interesting conversation and I think a really good question that how it could be. But I think in reality now we can't see that because women are completely un- underrepresented in all of the industries. It's conceiving of like a different operating model, right? So one where at the, if at the moment it's like picturing like a cutthroat boardroom, um, maybe there's a different model and, and I see it in politics, right? Some of the most, um, the fiercest politicians, they're not, they're, they're women. They're very powerful, strong people in, in that setting. But yeah, anyway, it's a... Uh, <laughs> it's a never-ending yeah. conversation because actually politics is a really male-dominated world. I mean, we also have an episode about that in our in our show, which is in Spanish, where we address women representation in media, and it's horrendous. Like, and that also shape our way to to see the world as well, you know. And so maybe maybe to kind of round out the conversation, I'd like to to focus on one last point of inquiry, and it's back to this idea of the analogy of the bowling ball and the feather. And so this idea of men as a bowling ball being aggressive, uh, masculine, heavy-handed, toxic masculinity is a term that's gained a lot of um, prominence over the last couple of years. Uh, What's your take as a feminist on how you define something like toxic masculinity and how do we strike that balance between, you know, going back to kids, we're all parents here, raising boys in a way that provides them support so they don't end up, I suppose, fearing masculinity in general? That is a really good one, uh, Roger. There is an interesting research called the Man Box, uh, which is a comprehensive study focusing on attitudes of manhood and behaviors of young Australian between 18 and 30 years that it was published in 2018. And why I think it's a very good example, because it shows how complicated it's not only for women when you can see toxic masculinity or an hegemonic masculinity because it's also harmful for the same people who perform that and for his environment. And I like to also always take conversations around fact and research because that also helped us to kind of put more information despite of what I believe. But this research shows that people between really young age, I I mean, that's for me, it's very kind of alarming because sometimes we tend to think that people who perform or behave in a toxic masculinity or hegemonic masculinity We maybe have a sort of stereotype that could be someone older, you know, being touch, old style. But younger people are actually still having those ideas in mind. And it's very harmful. And and this study actually shows that people and young Australians who who embrace or feel that pressure from society, they tend to be more likely to commit suicide. They tend to be more likely to be assaulted women. They tend to be more likely violent, abuse of someone else, to use drugs, alcohol more than their peers. So from my point of view, I think 
it's what we discussed at the beginning, you know, like when, when you raise a boy since really young age and you don't teach them that they can look after someone else, that they can cook, they can talk about their feelings, they can cry. You are also putting them in a box, assuming that a man can perform in another way. Or it, the same conversation that, that we, I think we may have more often about women performing in some sort of way because they are women. But in the case of the men, it's also the same thing, right? In one of our episodes, we actually spoke with an anthropologist who is very focused on masculinity. And he shared a good example, like a colleague of them was sharing that one day he received a really bad news and he cried in his office. And he was kind of very ashamed for that because he was mm. also in the presence of his boss. But then at the end of the meeting, actually one of his colleagues said to him, like, you know what? Don't worry because... I can't cry. I couldn't cry when my dad died. I can't cry. So I'm really trying now that I'm an older man to 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 be able to kind of work with my feeling because it's it's not something that I feel, you know, proud of it. So I don't know if that kind of maybe answer your your question. Um and this sort of study also it's been performed in Mexico and UK. Yeah in US and it's showing kind of the same result like people at young age it's also yeah. feeling a lot of pressure about to behave and perform in certain ways. I definitely relate to that and actually Andy and I have spoken about this phenomenon of crying um, and, and how much of it is is there from the start or if there are differences between um, the genders in this uh, predisposition versus how much is learned right the fact that if you cry as a young boy, is often by other men, you'll be told to, to not cry. And while girls especially have a little bit more tolerance for that, um, and there will people will actually come to their aid and, and help them and support them, whilst you get to a certain age as a boy and it's not really tolerated. And how that then affects later on, like you said, that ability not to cry or to to let yourself um, have that experience. So I, I definitely relate to that. Natalia, can, I guess I'm interested. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, like, Roger, like, uh, and I'm going to like throw myself out there as like a, um, a a bloke who doesn't tend to cry. I hear like often like it put, you know, oh, you know, men, you know, get more in touch with the emotions and, you know, it's good to have a cry. Like, can I ask, what is good about crying? Tell, tell someone, I want to hear the story. Like what? What is the what is the secret spice in crying? Why is this what like? Because I my natural instincts are like, oh well, it's good, yeah, like it's good. I don't I don't feel the need to cry. Isn't that a good thing? Like, t tell tell me tell me the <laughs> I want to hear the story. <laughs> well, I was actually raised very tough by my dad, and for some part of my life, I also was really hard for me to cry. So I have had the feeling to be. Um, in, 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 in like a long time, like don't being able to cry. But I but when I'm now kind of let that go and I cry a lot and I can see the difference. When you cry you release a lot of your frustration, you know? And and also after like I don't know how many minutes because I, a friend of mine shared that fact to me that you release some hormones and that actually help your brain to kind of feel you more balanced and happy. It's kind of when you reset your computer as well, you know. So another way to kind of release frustration, it could be punch someone, you know. So uh, I, I'm not saying that that's your your case you know because i have a lot of people i know around my my cycle they, they don't cry but there's a lot of way that you can release frustration and a lot of negative feelings that sometimes you hold on top of you that it's good to let it go you know in some in some way i'm, <laughs> I'm just thinking of that uh, episode of arrested development where um, michael who's the main character who's very stoic finally breaks down and cries when he finally gets what he wants but the result is that everyone witnessing him crying is just disgusted because he's crying. <laughs> um, and my, I'm just thinking of my dad because he's the same way um, as a, you know, as an Asian immigrant father. It's um, it's a it's a sign of weakness uh, yeah. rather than um, something nowadays, which is you know you're in touch with emotions. But you know, I think that's that's what it is. It's like the highs and lows of life, right? It's like any other exper experience of extremes. For me, sometimes that's what crying c c can mean, right? It's like something amazing has happened or something horrible has happened either way it's a way for the body to, to vent um, some of that pressure off but 
And so I just want to just probe into a little bit of your response about that question. And I want to kind of attack it from a slightly different angle, which is we talked a little bit about the negative impact toxic masculinity may have um, as a kid and how that then manifests throughout the life of men and how they then go on to affect um, women and other people. But what in your mind should be celebrated to counteract that, right? You hear this line at the moment that men are kind of afraid of the beast inside of them and they're being taught that they're dangerous and that they that they should be, you know, controlled or wheeled in like Hannibal Lecter because their base instinct is to oppress women and, um, and you know, all these kind of things, right, and, and patriarchy. What in your mind like needs to be celebrated and what are still the the things that can be celebrated about um, masculinity? Well, masculinity, I think as a definition, I don't know, like I don't think nothing good can come up from toxic masculinity, you know? But masculinity like a gender is neither a natural biological category or fix because it's defined by norm, you know? So I don't think it's nothing bad or good about that. It's it's about which sort of masculinity you can perform in your life, you know? There are toxic masculinity or maybe a hegemonic masculinity could be one of the type of masculinity, but there are also like accomplished masculinity and egalitarian masculinity. So you can perform another way, you know, and, and, and maybe an egalitarian masculinity could be more beneficial not even for women only for the society or also for yourself so there are different ways for men to live their masculinity you know just, just to um draw out roger's question a bit more like if i think about like stereotypical kind of masculinity right i'm thinking the toxic you know, like the, the hegemonic well, one well more well okay so maybe a more general sort of view of just masculinity like the kinds of things that men do that maybe are exclusionary to women. So things like, um, you know, playing golf, right, with the boys, right, on the weekend while the partner is at home looking after the kids, right, just to give an example, right, and having some beers on the golf course and, you know, bro talk, all that sort of stuff, right. I guess there's some parts of that in that sort of characterization I've given that are clearly sort of disadvantageous and maybe have, the, you know, a negative side. But I guess on the on the positive side, you might say, oh, well, this is like solidarity between, this is friendship, this is this is like mateship here. There's a part of it which is about building bonds. Maybe the fact that it is in some ways even exclusionary is part of what um, builds stronger ties, you know. You know, I, I guess, um, is there some aspect of it that's redeeming? And I'm not saying that they're necessarily, yeah. I'm not saying that is necessarily the case, but is there, you know, not the toxic bit, but the ma- just the masculinity <laughs> part, the the um you know the the the, the quintessential sort of blokes at the can, pub you know is there anything <laughs> about that that's um w- worth keeping I guess can I um can I double team on that with an example that I had actually just the other day which talks about this right so so I've got a friend and their kid came back from school their kid is his boy and uh, I believe nine years old and he got into a fight on in in the schoolyard. So he came back home, it's a bit roughed up and, you know, there was there was a little bit of blood here and the mother was saying, oh no, you know, like, why did that happen? Why did, why did you, why did you fight? You know, violence is never the answer. Um, you should have kind of, you know, reasoned with him and, and talked what, like what happened and the father just kind of stuck his head in and said, did you win? So obviously that is a very clear example, right? But what's embedded in that word of did you win is that there are good bits embedded in that around standing your ground actually standing up for yourself, um, being able not to be pushed around. Um, and I think what I'm trying to get at is, especially with kids, where is that counterbalance? Where is that celebration of actually um, what it means to, to to kind of hold some of those traditional masculine values that, that do serve a purpose but can be obviously um, a knife's edge sometimes? Mm, I don't know if you can actually kind of associate to kind of stand up for yourself as a masculine value, you know. I think, you know, we can all stand up for, your, for ourselves and and if we, for example, like sometimes we can talk about traditions, you know, there are a lot of traditions that are also like, oh my God, this is kind of like, you know, well, maybe it's time to change it, you know, like 500 years ago, like slavery was, you know, legally and allowed, like people will say, oh, look, I'm really good with my slave. I let them to eat what I eat. They can have some days off, but you know, like 
despite that, it's not good because you can own people, you know? So we can all behave differently. Like you can also teach your kids to stand up for themselves. There is a way to do that as well. Yeah. And it's, it's less about standing up for themselves, but the way the father said it, right? In that masculine way, it's like, did you win? And it, it's something that I think people can, of our generation can relate to because there was still, and there still is in society, this idea that strength is still a good thing, right? Um, and that, you know, it's, it's akin with the masculine to be able to, to, to fight back. Doesn't this like underscore like the need for definitions, right? Because yeah, I mean, like what is even like masculinity? Like, isn't it context dependent and I mean, it's cultural, right? Yeah. But you know what, like to kind of wrap up, like I think we are all evolving and I think that's amazing about being alive and to have the aptitude to be open to improve ourselves or change things if they don't like it like I thought also when I was in Chile living my life in my country with all my environment that I know my language and everything that I knew I, I also thought that I was feminist but now when I came to Australia I realized that I wasn't totally feminist maybe back then. Like in some occasions I do behave in a way that I'm not, you know, happy with the way that I did. But I also have to think that I was perhaps 14 years old. I, were, I was raised in a way by a family. I was raised by a parent who performed a, an hegemonic masculinity to live. He was very traditional, you know, like he also stand up for some religion. I went to a girl's school, a lot of things, you know, but then like life, it's always giving us opportunities to review and make changes, you know, and take opportunities and how you do that, you know, like, so now for me, and that's what I, I mentioned previously, like now for me, I'm, I'm women, but I'm also Latino. I, I also have another ingredients in my backpack, you know, that I have to carry on. So sometimes if I experience something, it could be because I'm Latino, it could be because I'm a woman, it because um, like my English is not my first language. There's a lot of things that it sometimes can be difficult to to change, but we, we, we are making decisions, you know, and we are trying to be different you know what i mean yeah i want to tell you i want, I want to thank you so much for for joining the show and I, I think we you know we had a great conversation around um the feminist topic and it's such a large topic I and mean, we could talk for for hours and hours on it and just to wrap i want to leave you with one uh one experience i've had that's changed a lot in my career at my company and that is we had this practice. Every time we, we the elevator doors opened, the men would hold the doors open and let the women out first. It was just a cultural thing uh, for the company and it always happened. And now it's slowly starting to change. And I just want to get your hot take on chivalrous acts like that <laughs> and how they, um, you know, how... Uh, whether, whether Sh shovel out the way. That's... <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna leave me out of the yeah. So um, just want to see is that uh, if you see me. is that is that uh, cancelled in 2023 or what's your view on the holding the door open for for women in the office? Uh, I don't know. I think I don't associate sometimes things like that to gender. You know, that's that's the thing. Like sometimes you want to be kind. Like, I mean, if it's something that comes to you, this was definitely you a gender thing. <laughs> now yeah, I can tell saying, you, Roger like, has never let me out of the elevator first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and get, I try yeah, to get as far as way. I don't know. I don't have any like particular position about things like that. Roger, <laughs> you can always pay for my lunch. I'll be very happy. For <laughs> Just to, to mention something about equality. Um, not everything sometimes to to make things more fair. Uh, it's about fifty fifty. And your example came out with another uh, with another example that I wrote in a in a book that it's called Invisible Women, that it's amazing. And I highly recommend it to read. Um, it shows that, for example, do you think it's fair that a shopping center has one bathroom for men and one bathroom for women? What are your thoughts about that? Apparently the old Sydney football stadium, which was demolished and they've rebuilt the new Allianz Stadium, apparently at three out of every four toilets in that stadium were were men's toilets and they only had like one in one in four were, were women's toilets so um i'm not sure what kind of message that's saying about um yeah women <laughs> attending sporting matches but um but i think if what you're i guess it's like equal uh consideration of equal interests right so if the needs are different then they need to be catered for differently right exactly well according to data 
we women use more the bathroom, public bathroom. We spend more time in public bathroom, you know. So if you want to have actually a really good gender policy when it comes to uh, infrastructure or urbanism, you should have maybe two or three bathrooms for women yeah. instead of having one equally because you will use it more often. And it's a really good example. When I go to shows and concerts, you can see the line, the queue for men bathroom, and it's going really quickly and it's really short. Sometimes women also use men bathroom because there is not enough bathroom, you know, for women. So, yeah, not always to address gender equality, some measures are to have equal things, you know. So you need to really be careful about what do you want to address, I guess. Nat, I've just yeah. got one um, final toilet-related anecdote. <laughs> Last week we were talking about the toilets at Sydney train stations and how they have unisex toilets, right? Yes. So it's like this you know, cubicles, right? Is that an improvement or is that like a step backwards? I don't know, but in my case, it really annoys me when I see, when I still see that parents' bathroom, changing nappy bathroom are in women's bathroom. Yeah. That's completely going backwards. <laughs> like a man, it's incapable to change a nappy. Yes. And I have seen a few of them. They are still existing. So that is actually, I think, worse. Yeah, it's actually when I'm with my daughter and I have lots of memories of her needing to go to the toilet and um, it being very hard for me because they assume that men are not doing that, the, the mothers are. And so it's very hard sometimes to to accompany them when they when they need to or you'd have to use a disabled toilet, um, which of course you always feel that panic that you're going to open the door and see someone there in a wheelchair and just be shamed, uh, shame pointed as you leave the shopping mall. So uh um, it, it goes kind of both ways in some way. <laughs> I know. For the, for the it would be really complicated, I think, for a dad who wants to change the nappy to decide what I'm going to do. Like, I'm going to take my little daughter to a men bathroom when maybe she will be exposed to a lot of penis and they haven't kind of addressed that at home. I don't know. And or, or, or I, should I jump into the women bathroom? Um, my husband, it's really egalitarian masculinity so he has no problem he will go to a women bathroom anyway but yeah like it shouldn't be do the, do the women have a problem with it <laughs> um i don't think so because when i have seen those issues you know i do have the option but my husband doesn't you know well i know westfields have parents rooms so that's a um a step yeah. in the right direction yes Thank you, Nat, just again from me and appreciate your, you coming on and um, being generous with your time tonight. Yeah, no, no problem. Thank you for the invitation. I really love your koala and your, <laughs> <laughs> and your... It's a really good koala, actually. Yes.